So first, let's, uh, you know, obviously, I, I know you really well. We went to PT school together, but uh, I'd like to maybe just introduce yourself to uh, to our audience and tell people a little bit about yourself and, you know, your interests and, and your background and what you love. Yeah. Okay. I'm Valerie Fagali. And um, so my background really is in physical therapy. So I did physical therapy for 10 years. I studied with Sean at Northeastern University and, um you know, working 10 years in the health field and seeing people with all kinds of issues from chronic illnesses to, you know, more acute issues that they're having trouble dealing with. And I often felt that there was this lack in the healthcare model of treating the underlying cause of, you know, what people are eating, how they're interacting at home, what their social life is like, which vastly affects how they're going to heal from injury. And then of course affects their, you know, chronic state and any sort of chronic illnesses that they're dealing with. So I felt like there was this hole in the healthcare model, which is why I started to learn more and more about nutrition and start to dive deeper into that field of work. Um, and then just about a year ago is when I just broke off on my own, starting my own business and decided that nutrition was really what I wanted to do and what I wanted to focus on, what I loved talking about. So that's where I am today. That's great. That's great. No, I think, uh, you know, nutrition is such an undervalued, um, you know, option in, in our healthcare system. And, and I feel like, especially as a busy PT, when you have a full caseload, which you can, you know, you've been, you've been down that path, you've done it. It's so hard to talk about nutrition and, and stress and sleep and, uh, you know, total body wellness. And, um, you know, I, I found that when you've worked with some of my patients who are, um, you know, even not super complicated, but, you know, people who just need a little bit more time. Uh, it's just been a really transformative um, collaboration for their overall health. Uh, so that's really cool. So let's talk about, um, you know, a little bit about what you feel as though the, the most important aspects of building a healthy lifestyle are. Yeah. So, you know, I really think that there are a few like critical parts of just overall health. And of course, you know, we'll talk more about nutrition in this, in this um, interview, but nutrition, of course, being one of them. So having a clean, well-balanced diet and supporting the body in that way is of course, hugely important. Then you have your exercise, you know, how are you moving? How are you moving the blood, the lymph through the body to be able to detox and cleanse? Um, and then also, of course, good for your posture, which is good for confidence. It's good for digestion, so much more. Um, but then there are other things on top of that, like stress management, right? It's hugely important in this day and age. Now, I do feel like we need to reframe our mindset around stress a little bit. It's not so much about kind of eliminating stress with so which so many people are trying to do trying to eliminate that stress which stress is actually good for us we need stress we need that challenge our body thrives on that if we're able to recognize it as something good for us and there have been studies that have shown that people who view stress as something positive actually live longer whereas people who view stress as something negative are the ones who end up with chronic illness and, you know, other issues down the line. So reframing our mindset on stress, figuring out what in our life is important and what we need to kind of focus on in order to um, manage that stress and what type of stress is important and what we can, what we can kind of get rid of and not have to deal with how we delegate all those types of things. Um, and then sleep, sleep is hugely important, right? So sleep is when we rebuild, it's when we repair, it's when our cells actually, you know, we get rid of the ones that we don't need anymore that are damaged and we build new ones that all happens during the sleep phase. We release gro human growth hormone and we repair our body. So if we're not getting adequate sleep and more importantly, if we're not getting quality sleep, then we're not getting that repair that the body needs to thrive. Human connection is perhaps the most important, I think, pillar to health. So having that social network of people, which people, of course, right now in 2020 struggled with so much and 2021 will be a struggle as well. Um, but it's, it's critical. We need human connection. Not only does human connection improve our mental state, but it actually improves our physical state as well. When we interact with people, we trade bugs, we trade good bacteria, right? Our body has more than 50 billion bacteria in and on it that help us produce hormones and help us regulate our bodies. And when we interact with people, we trade bugs and our biodiversity of that gut microbiome 
continues to grow and we become more able to fight off illness, become better at, you know, more efficient with our metabolism and so much more. So that human connection is, is huge. Um, and then purpose, you know, purpose is of course, one of the most important things to, to health too. Like, why are we here? What's, what's your reason for doing what you're doing and, and what drives you? And that kind of speaks for itself. Yeah, no, that's great. I think, uh, you know, you touched on a really, a couple of great points and I think, you know, so I guess my question, my next question would be, you know, in terms of breaking it down, maybe let's talk about stress, right? So stressors, you know, in your teenage years and early twenties and, and, you know, when you start a family are going to be different, you know, than stressors when you're 50, 60, 70 years old. So can you talk about, you know, maybe the different types of stress and, and you know, so I think of, you know, this is just where my brain goes, you know, obviously, you know, raising a family can have its own stresses, but, you know, I look at like a Tom Brady, right. Who's, you know, maybe that's a different type of stress, but how is he able to, to take all of that stress of having to perform over and over and over again and transform it into such a positive um, outcome, I guess, you know, I, I feel like he's constantly under a ton of stress, but, you know, is it mindset? What is it? How does, how is somebody like Tom Brady able to take stress and turn it into something successful and others, you know, take stress and, and they, you know, kind of crumble under it. Right. Well, you know, of course, I don't know exactly what Tom Brady does, but however, I can pretty much guarantee you it's a combination between mindset and physical health. You know, he obviously takes such great care of his physical health. He pays attention to his diet. I know that he's big on sleep. He's talked about it, you know, in the media. Um, and then, so there's different types of stress, right? There's internal stressors and then there's your external stressors. So, for you have kids, you know, so external stressors would be like noise in the house, right? <laughs> They're constantly screaming, right? And so that's an external stress. And so Brooke was walking by, she said, Tom Brady has a nanny. That's why he's not stressed out. <laughs> that's a really good point. Yeah. So that might be it. That's a secret to life right there. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, so some of those external stresses we can take off for ourselves, you know, how do we mitigate some of the noise in our house? So, so no, you can't necessarily stop your kids from screaming, but when they go to bed, are you keeping the house quiet or are you having the TV on or do you have the radio on constantly? You know, how can we eliminate some of that noise? You know, another external stress is how many activities we put on ourselves. So people are so obsessed with, you know, um, quick reinforcement and that sort of thing these days and, and the fear of missing out, right? So they plan all these things, pack the, all these things into their schedule that they don't necessarily have time for. And when do you actually have that time to decompress? So scheduling time into your routine to actually decompress can be a huge you know, um, way to manage the amount of stress that, that you're under externally. Um, and then there are, of course, others, but your internal stressors would be more like things like high blood pressure, right? Um, issues with your GI tract. Those are internal stressors that are going to cause inflammation in the body and put your body under strain um, and eventually lead to, lead to problems. And that also we can control and, and they work together. So when we are stressed out, right? When we have that feeling of stress, which is really a fight or flight response, we release norepinephrine, we release cortisol. And that was made for us to be able to outrun a bear when we were in trouble, right? But now we release those hormones when we're under different types of stressors, like stress at work, stress with the family, that type of thing. And having those too many of those hormones in our body can reduce the health of the gut microbiome. So it can kill off some of our good gut bacteria, but also same with having too little of it, too little of it can cause us to be really low energy. Cortisol and norepinephrine are, are, are hormones that give us energy, right? So we need a steady balance of that. And that's kind of the, the, tricky part for people is, is what is that balance? How much is too much and how much is not enough? And sometimes it's trial and error. It's not the same for everybody. You know, some people really thrive on having a busy schedule where they go from five in the morning to eight o'clock at night and they love that and they thrive on that where other people would break down and, and burn out after six months, right? So a lot of it is, you know, trial and error. And if, if you're feeling overwhelmed, then you do need to find a way to kind of manage that both internally through diet and exercise and ex externally through, you know, what in your life can you kind of cut out, right? Nope, you're frozen, Sean. Oh, there you Great. are. You're back. You know, I think, um, you know, to your, I think we're good. Um, you know, I think to your point, you know, most people don't think, Val, about how their stress is related to their 
gastrointestinal tract or, or to their nutritional status, right? So there is a link there. And I think that's really important for people to understand that, you know, potentially if you're doing too much and you're stressed out, your, you know, your gut microbiome is changing. And I think, you know, most people aren't connecting that. Let's talk about, um, you know, like a baby boomer. So let's say you're 60 years old, 50, 60 years, years old plus, you know, they've got different stressors than, you know, than we do, like I was talking about. How does, how does their gut you know, biome, is, the, is it sort of reacting the same? And, and what advice would you give to somebody who's, you know, 60 years old plus, um, you know, trying to manage stress and to, and to live a healthy lifestyle? Yeah. yeah. Well, when it comes, if we're talking about, you know, how stress impacts the gut mi microbiome, you do have to think of the gut microbiome as like an, a living thing because it is, you know, we, what controls the gut microbiome are those billions of live bacteria we have in the gut. So how do you support that? Right. How do you feed the good ones? and bring, bring in more of the good ones and push out the bad guys, right? Because if we allow the bad guys to grow, they're gonna take over the, state, the space. Um, and by feeding your body through, you know, um, refined sugars, refined flours, that all feeds the bad gut bacteria. Now, if we wanna support the good gut bacteria, we have to eliminate things like, you know, meat with antibiotics in it. So 80% of antibiotics sold in America go to the meat industry. And that is made to, you know, help the sick animals, but it's also made to make them fat, believe it or not. The more antibiotics you give an animal, the fatter they get because it kills off their gut microbiome. So it's the same with humans. The more antibiotics that we, that we take in, the fatter we get. And we're taking them in through our meat. When you have meat that's been fed antibiotics, you are then taking that in secondarily. So looking for organic meat and then also grass fed, it's super important that you have grass fed and grass finished meat and wild caught fish versus farm raised fish, because those wild caught and that grass fed meat are fed their natural diet and we really are what we eat. And so we don't wanna be eating the stress hormones and the antibiotics through our through our fish and through our meat. Other, that way we're just getting it in ourselves. We might as well you know, be taking an antibiotic pill if we're, if we're doing that. And that can make us sick, right? So that kills off the gut bacteria too. But then there's more than that. So, why, so how do we sustain the good gut bacteria? So, okay, if we have, if, if we're not eating that, but how do we make that good gut bacteria grow even more? And that's how we support it with like prebiotics. So things that have a lot of fiber in them. So your fruits and your vegetables, and you want to get a variety of things. So you don't want to just be eating leafy greens. You want to have your leafy greens, your red peppers, your red apples, your yellow, you know, squash. You want to try to incorporate all those colors because the colors actually signify which micronutrients are in that fruit and that vegetable. So the more diverse you can get with kind of eating the rainbow, and I'm not talking about Skittles, but <laughs> um, your vegetables, right, then the better off your, your gut microbiome is going to be because all of the different bacteria feed on different micronutrients and different types of fiber um, and different, different things. So if we are getting it all in through the diet, through a clean source and, you know, having fiber as like Metamucil, let's say, or fiber enriched cereal is not the same as getting it in as your whole food, your sweet potato or your pepper. It's much, much different type of fiber um, and much more bioavailable through the whole foods form. So yeah, eating a diverse, you know, a diverse rainbow vegetable and fruit <laughs> diet um, can help to feed that good, that good gut bacteria. And there are specific prebiotics too, like cacao, um, chicory root, asparagus, garlic, onions are all really good for feeding the good gut bacteria as well. That's great. I mean, I think that's something, you know, another like clinical pearl, right? I mean, I, don't, I would never have equated antibiotic consumption with adiposity or obesity. You know, I think that's something that I, I wouldn't have, you know, equated. So I think the average, uh, you know, older adult or, or even just regular person wouldn't even think about, you know, the fact that cows are fattened up using antibiotics. I think you, you typically think that they're fattened up with, you know, corn or grain, you know, uh, but it makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah. yeah you know, they started using, funny. yeah. I mean, that's why they started using more and more of it because it was showing that their, their bottom line was getting better. You know, they were able to produce more meat, the more antibiotics they gave 
they gave the animals because they were getting better. Um, but the meat, you know, it's not as good quality. It's really, really high. Also, the, the change also that happens in the meat itself is that it becomes higher in omega sixes and lower in omega threes. So grass fed meat has about five times or up to five times more omega threes than um, like a corn or grain fed meat. So we need that to fight inflammation and having that balance be out of whack is also what causes sickness and chronic inflammation in the body, which leads to heart disease. It leads to diabetes and, you know, so much more. So what are the good omegas? It's three. So you need about, it's the balance that we need. So okay. there's omega three, six, and nine, but we need, it's really those omega threes to omega six ratio that we need to have in balance. Now okay. we do need more O six omega sixes and omega threes, about a four to one ratio. However, the problem is in a standard American diet, it's anywhere from 30 to one to 50 to one. We get far more omega sixes in our diet, like significantly more than omega threes. And those omega threes are what lead to brain health. So your memory, your cognition, if you're feeling fatigued or brain fog, it might be because you're not getting enough omega threes. Um, so that's super, are super important. And also just to decrease inflammation. If you're having joint issues, I mean, you see people all the time that are having joint related concerns and it may partly be because they're not getting that right ratio of omega threes to omega sixes. And one way to boost your omega three intake is you can either do, you know, fatty fish twice a week should be enough to get it. Or um, you can also take a supplement, you know, cod liver oil supplements are among some of the best types and you can speak to your doctor about proper dosages for you, but um, you can just do it through supplement form. It's also in chia seeds and flax seeds, just in a different variation. So there's EPA and DHA, which are in your fatty fish, farm raised fatty fish. And then there's the ALA, which are in like chia seeds and flax seeds. And that needs to be converted to an EPA or a DHA in our body to be used effectively. So although there's a lot in the chia seeds and flax seeds, we just don't use, utilize it quite as well. Not to say that you can't get it in that form. You just have to be eating more of it if you do it that way. Gotcha. So you said farm raised fish. Did you mean a wild caught or Sorry, wild caught fish? Yes. If yeah, I said farm raised. Um, no, I think that's important. Right. You know, I, I think so twice a week fish. I know I take a, an omega supplement, um, yeah. you know, once a day. Um, but no, in terms of supplementation, right. So just in terms of, I guess if we're looking at our American diet, right. I mean, you know, like in full disclosure, we had Chick-fil-A yesterday, right? So I can probably guarantee that, you know, of my patient caseload and, and most patients that I see, you know, most folks are eating out at least once a week, maybe due to just the busy nature of, of their lives. Um, you know, what would you recommend for folks who are busy and they work jobs, they've got families and, you know, they try to cook a healthy meal every couple of days, but it's just not a realistic option. Yeah. Um, what would you recommend in terms of supplementation or what sort of advice would you give those folks? Yeah. Well, you know, I think starting with, you know, how do you get the healthy meals in number one, like meal prep is, is so important. So picking a day of the week, so, or maybe even two days a week, let's say Sunday and Wednesday, where you do like an hour of meal prep, where you cut up all the vegetables, you cut up all the fruits, you cook the meats that you're going to be having for that week and you pre-portion them and put them away. Right. And you don't have to make the entire meal necessarily, unless of course it's like a chili or something like that. That's easy to keep in the fridge or the freezer. That's fine. But if you want a salad for lunch, you don't have to put together the whole salad salad, but chop up everything you're going to put on top so that when you go to make it, it takes 90 seconds. Right. Um, and right. then, you know, easy things too, like protein powder. If you do a protein shake and you throw in some like matcha tea or spirulina to try to get the greens, right. Or if you put in, you know, your protein powder and very, there are various types of protein powder. You do have to be really careful that the one you're taking is well studied because there are, heavy metals and a lot of different protein powders that you have to kind of really be careful of. Um, but I can always send your, your members a, a list of ones that I would, you know, advise. Um, yeah, and that can be an easy way to, yeah, get that, that protein. And then in terms of supplementation, it is hard because our soil is so depleted at this point in, you know, our crops. And oftentimes we're getting crops from around the world. So they're not picked when they're ripe. They're being ripened on the way here in the truck. Right. So, um, a lot of times, yeah, they don't have adequate amounts of those micronutrients that we need. So, you know, I can't make, um, recommendations without, without speaking to anybody, but in general, people do really good on a omega-3, a vitamin D and a magnesium supplement. Those are ones that I commonly suggest they look further into um, 
to really try to get those, those important, those critical nutrients. And vitamin D is better absorbed when it's taken with, with K, K1 as well too. So, um, that's something that I would look for. And if you haven't gotten your vitamin D levels checked through your blood work, I think that it's important to do, especially us living in the Northeast. So many people are deficient in vitamin D that leads to anxiety, depression, and then other chronic illnesses as well. So it's something to, something to get checked for sure. What about magnesium? So what do you see when, when people are uh, low in magnesium? Low energy. Yeah mostly low energy. Um, some of that brain fog too, can be another, another symptom of that. Um, and it's, it's important for the cell to have magnesium in order to, to make energy. That's really what it's for. So now can you ask your primary care to run, you know, as part of a typical panel, you know, they can check for magnesium, vitamin D and all that. Yeah. Yep. You can ask for those specifically. And and that is the tricky thing is that oftentimes we do need to ask for exactly what we want checked because they're not going to run everything under the sun unless they have a reason to. And a lot of that is because of insurance reasons. And, you know, there's a whole, there's a whole politics behind all of that too. Right. But if you want something specifically checked, then if you've talked to, you know, someone who's an expert in nutrition or, or you have a reason to believe that you might be low in something, you do have to ask for that specifically when you get your blood work done. Yeah. And there are kits that'll do it too for you. Right. So we were talking about that a couple of weeks ago. I, I know there are some at home kits. What is your yeah. feeling on those kits versus actually having it done through the, through the doctor's office? You know, I'll have to look into that a little bit more for you. You know, there are a lot of kits for like food sensitivity tests that I feel are quite accurate. Um, so that's a good test to have done through like an at home kit sort of thing, but to actually get like your blood work done, they do, there is a way to do it. And there are doctors that will do it that way. Um, that you don't have to be, you know, they don't have to be your primary care doctor or anything like that. Um, the accuracy and the price, you know, I'd have to look a little bit further, further into that for you. (laughs) Yeah, no, that's great. Um, common misconceptions to health and diet. Gosh. Oh, well, I would say one of the, one of the big ones, especially with like kind of the baby boomer age, um, for so long, people were told like eat six small meals a day, right? Just be eating all day long, which is some of the worst advice really. Um, that keeps your blood sugar at this like stable elevated level all day long, which really is not, is not a good thing. We need those steady ups, those steady downs so that our body becomes sensitive to insulin and that it still responds to insulin when it's being released, right? So insulin takes those sugar out of the blood and it puts it away. And we need to be, um, our bodies need to respond to that well. Otherwise we have extra insulin floating around the the system and and elevated blood sugars all the time, which is really, really not a good thing. Um, So to improve your insulin sensitivity and to improve your metabolism, having like three set meals a day is really the way you want to do it. You know, some people might even tell you two set meals a day, which isn't necessarily a bad strategy. It just kind of depends on your routine, your age, other, you know, illnesses that you may be dealing with. Um, but two to three set meals a day where you sit down with your meal, you know, it's something prepared ahead of time is really the, one of the best things you can do for yourselves. Snacking all day long is, is not, it's not good. Um, and then and what another, I think that's, you know, just to, not to just to jump yeah. in, you know, I think yeah. the conventional wisdom behind that was, you know, keep your metabolism going all day long. Right. And that's yeah. even back in call. I mean, you know, 10 years ago, that's what they were teaching in nutrition class. Yeah. You know, they were saying, eat the, you know, the five square, you know, the four or five meals, eat every couple hours, keep your metabolism going. So I think it's really interesting, um, right. you know, that you're, you know, taking a different tack and it makes sense. Yeah. Our bodies need rest in between, number one, for so many reasons. One of them is the insulin sensitivity that we just touched upon. But another reason is because we need to allow our bodies time to rest and repair and heal. If we're constantly in the digestion mode, then we're always releasing the hormones and the chemicals and the enzymes made for digestion. And we have a lot more processes in our body that need to happen other than just just digestion. So we need to take ourselves out of that phase throughout the day. And then especially at night, one of the worst things that you can do is eat late into the evening. So if people are looking for like a quick tip, like what's the first thing that I should do, 
stop eating after dinner, right? Dinner is over and then, you know, the kitchen is closed after that. So if you keep eating well into the evening up until when you go to bed, that's when we stay in that digestion mode. It messes up our sleep. It doesn't allow for the adequate amounts of growth hormone to be released and our body to be repaired. Um, and that can be one of the most detrimental things to our health and then also to our metabolism and, and for weight gain too. So I would certainly say that's one of the things um, to cut, try to cut out if you're looking for a healthier lifestyle. Yeah. Another common misconception that I hear all the time is like, well, how many calories? So many of my clients ask me, well, how many calories should I eat? Right. And it's really not about calories in calories out thinking of our body as like a furnace, right? So how did they calculate calories? They calculate calories by basically burning whatever that food is and seeing how long it takes to burn or how long it takes to create a certain temperature water, right? So by thinking of our body as like a burning furnace completely negates the complexity of the human body, right? So there are, there's so much more. And first of all, it takes calories to burn calories, it takes far more calories to burn protein than it does to burn carbohydrates or fat. So that's one thing. So the more protein you're eating, the more calories you're burning in order to, to digest that protein, right? And then also there's so much of that we eat that is indigestible, especially if you're eating fruits and vegetables, which is a good thing because some of that indigestible material is actually eaten by our gut microbiome and it feeds the gut microbiome. It doesn't feed us, our bodies, it feeds our gut microbiome. Right. And so, you know, saying a calorie is a calorie. Like I have so many people who are like, well, I stick, I, you know, for a little while I stuck to this like 1200, um, calorie diet and I lost like 50 pounds. I'm like, okay, well, it's six months from now you've gained 65 pounds back. Right. So it doesn't work. It's not sustainable. Um, so depriving yourself is really not a good way to lose weight and, and maintain and create health. Um, you really have to pay attention to the quality of the calories that you're getting in your body will go back to its natural desired weight. If you're feeding it proper quality calories. Now let's talk about age, right? So, you know, everybody's metabolism, I would assume kind of slows down a little bit with age. Um, is that right or wrong? Or like, how do, how would you approach, a, a, you know, a, a weight loss plan? So let's say somebody's primary goal was to lose weight. How would you approach it differently with a 65 year old than a 30 year old? Yeah, it depends a lot on their lifestyle too. So like, for example, a 30 year old, I'm depending on the rest of their life. I may, may recommend something like intermittent fasting, right. Where they're doing time restricted eating, for the older adult, I may not recommend that um, right off the bat. Um, it might be something, you know, we talked about like getting those three set meals in, which is, which is super important for everybody, unless you're doing two meals, which you can do, you know, you can do at any age, but it really depends on your external stressors. So somebody who's a little bit older and has a lot of stress, I would not recommend intermittent fasting for where somebody who's a little bit older, but has virtually like very minimal stress is very good at managing their stress, then they may be able to take that on really well. Um, and the reason for that is we do re release a little bit more cortisol when we are in the fasting stage, which is again, our stress hormone. And it can be very good in the morning for us to be releasing that because we need to release cortisol early in the day to give us energy for the remainder of the day. Um, but if you're really stressed out and you're over a certain age, so you have other internal stressors going on, then it may not be a good um, strategy to use. Um, and then, you know, the, the older body, it digests and breaks down things differently. So, you know, one thing that sometimes for an older individual, I may recommend like cutting out gluten and cutting out dairy. A lot of times that can really serve them well and help them heal and repair some of the cells that in the DNA that's been damaged over time, um, and give the body a bit of a rest. And it doesn't necessarily need to be a permanent thing, but if they do it for, you know, a month or two months and just allow the body to repair, then some then they can slowly integrate those foods back into their diet. However, it really is individual. It's hard to say it depends on, you know, the person's activity level, what they do for work, you know, so many different things. If they have any sort of food sensitivities, if they have any, you know, other immune issues that they're dealing with, um, the diet recommendations would change a bit. Nice. No, that's great. Mm -hmm. Any other misconceptions that we missed? Um, I think a lot of, yeah. So a lot of things that I hear from people all the time is my doctor tells me I need to get more 
a couple things. My doctor tells me I need to get more calcium. So I'm drinking all this milk, right? Which is like not where you should be getting your calcium. So dairy, you know, all of us, I, I shouldn't say everyone, but a lot of people are, have some sort of sensitivity to dairy without being lactose intolerant. That's a different thing, right? But some sort of sensitivity to dairy. It's not, when you think about what dairy is, it was made to turn a small calf into like a two ton animal, right? It's not, so. It's a good, you know, really good point. Yeah, so right. So we have to be careful of how much dairy we're consuming. Now, fermented dairy like kefir or yogurt can be really, really good and have so many benefits to it. You know, they have the probiotics, they have, it, it's just so much better than um, consuming regular like cow's milk. And a lot of people are trying to get their calcium from skim milk, which is like one of the, one of the worst ways you can try to get your calcium. First of all, it's not absorbed well in that um, type of mix that's in skim milk. And secondly, it's loaded with sugar. Um, so better ways to get your calcium would be like broccoli, spinach, you know, there are so many other, um, lentils, so many other things that have calcium in them that are not dairy related. So that's one thing. Um, another thing is, you know, my doctor tells me I have high cholesterol, so I have to cut out red meat. <laughs> and that's another, that's another misconception. Like you don't have to cut out red meat. You just have to get high quality red meat. Like we talked about earlier, you know, cholesterol is essential to our cells. We cannot function without dietary cholesterol. It's essential. We need it. So we need some forms of it and it's good in like pasture raised eggs or in grass fed hundred percent, you know, fin grass finished organic meat. Um, it can be really, really a good thing. It's just that you have to get it in the right forms and in the right dosages. You don't need to cut out red meat to decrease your cholesterol. And in fact, that, that can cause more problems depending on where you're at. If you're substituting it with like a, you know, cereal, then you're not, you're not doing yourself any benefit. Yeah. I think it's, you know, it's funny when you mention that because I feel like there's always a war against eggs, right? So <laughs> because one egg theoretically has, you know, hundred percent of your daily cholesterol, right. Or something like that, or two eggs, I forget what the serving size is, but cholesterol is also a precursor to testosterone to a lot of, you know, essential hormones. Yeah. Uh, yeah we people, need it. People don't yeah. think about that. So I think that, you know, that's, you know, that's a really neat point is that, you know, not all red meat is bad, you know, saturated fat isn't wonderful for you, but you can typically kind of see that on the cut, you know, and kind of cut that away if possible. Um, even though it makes it taste so much better. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think that's really, that's really interesting. Now in terms of, let's say somebody did, did have, um, you know, HLD or, or you know, high cholesterol, uh, how would you change their diet? So you're saying that red meat is okay. You just get the good stuff. Same thing with eggs, just get the good stuff which is, you know, the grass fed, grass finished. And then for the eggs, you're saying really farm, you know, farm to table type, like grown at a farm. They have yeah. plenty of that stuff around here. Pasture raised organic, right. It's going to be your sure. best. What else would you recommend for those with that um, high cholesterol? Right. So the first thing I would look at is, you know, what is their sugar intake and how much um, refined flours and sugars are they ingesting? So anytime, and then also like, um, refined, um, or excuse me, processed fats. So are they having things like, um, gosh, I'm having a hard time coming up with something right now, but stuff with a lot of processed fats in it. So anything you get in a box, box if you're getting potato chips or something like that, right. Kind of have a ton of processed fats, processed oils, and a ton of, uh, processed flour or corn. So those are things that we want to try to stay away from. So that's what I would ask first, you know, are you having cereal for breakfast? Because if you are, we need to change that up because that's going to cause more inflammation in the body. And that's going to be lead to more heart issues and more cardiac issues than cholesterol. Cholesterol can be managed if we take the inflammation away, right? So a certain amount of inflammation can be a good thing, especially if you have like an acute injury or something like that. We want to allow for some of the inflammation to occur, but when it's chronic inflammation in the body, that's very bad. Um, and that can lead more so to heart issues than high cholesterol. So that's the first thing that I would look at, you know, what is their quote unquote sugar intake and processed oil intake and how can we change that? You know, what oils are they using to cook? If they're using like vegetable oil to make their meals, you know, we're gonna, the right there, we're gonna change that up. Um, and in that sense, we would use, you would use olive oil for things you're not cooking. So for like a salad dressing or something like that, and for things you are cooking at a higher temperature, you're going to want to use like something like an avocado 
soil that has this higher smoke point and is not going to become denatured and damaged under heat. That's yeah. so funny because I've got avocado oil and I just <laughs> just got Pam spray because <laughs> oh, it doesn't come it doesn't come out easily. I don't know what it is. But, uh, so I'll have to <laughs> no. switch that back over. Yeah, you're, it's I'm funny though, Doc, because you you grow up with certain you know it's also part of the culture. You know, like you know Pam spray and and maybe you know I don't know if you remember spam. Remember spam back in the you know eighty like sixty. Oh yeah, 70s. I but, lived but, in Hawaii but, for a little while. The boy, do I know what spam is? <laughs> so you know that's like almost ingrained in, in the culture. It's just, it stays good forever, and you know it's cheap. And you know I, I'm not saying that I eat spam now, but you know I think you know, Pam, especially, it was just something we always had around the house when we were kids. And it was always sold as like this low calorie, you know, um, cooking emollient. And now we're kind of starting to learn a little bit more about it. And, you know, of course, all of their marketing says, you know, totally organic. No, it doesn't say organic, but it says this free, that free, you know, everything else. But right. One thing to know is that anything that says all natural on it, put it back on the shelf <laughs> because that's the marketing. That's their way of marketing around something that's fake and, and not good for you. If it says all natural on it, because there are absolutely no regulations around that term. So if it says all natural on it, put it back on the shelf. Now it says, if it says organic on it, that's different. That, that does actually mean something. So then you can, you can look in deeper into that, <laughs> that food product. But, um, but yeah, it's true. I mean, marketing is such a big piece of this right and what people if anything that says like heart healthy or low fat like well think about it do you do you get an apple that's like labeled heart healthy all over your apple no like something that's actually good for you doesn't need those labels right those whole fruits and vegetables the the grass-fed meats they don't we don't need to be putting labels all over it because we know innately that those are those are good things for us um, so yeah, don't right. be, don't be, uh, fall into the trick of like all the, you know, all natural and heart healthy and gluten free. It's all, it's all marketing. So I'm going to be careful with that stuff. Oh, like, that's <laughs> yeah. funny. That's funny. <laughs> um, <laughs> but here's my take on, you know, what are some... oh, go ahead. Yeah. So I was going to say, um, you know, some people might be watching this and being like, well, this is no fun, right? <laughs> I want to enjoy my cupcake or I want to enjoy this or that when I, when I eat it. And here's my thing about healthy eating is, is pick those moments where you're going to indulge, indulge and thoroughly enjoy them. So if it's your anniversary and you want to have a glass of champagne, have a glass of champagne. If it's, if you're at a birthday party and you want to have a cupcake, then go ahead and have it. It's when it becomes part of your daily routine that you're indulging in these things and they're no longer really enjoyable. It's more of a addiction. That's when it becomes a problem, right? We don't need that stuff every single day, but on occasion, yeah. I mean, if it's giving food is joy, food is comfort it's pleasure right so if you're really truly enjoying it weigh the pros and the cons you know and make that conscious decision that mind quote unquote mindful eating right and so if you're telling yourself if you're looking at something that you know is you know is bad for you but you really want it and you're saying well it's it's worth it to me to eat it then that's fine but if it's more of a habit and you're you're finding yourself standing in front of the refrigerator like shoveling in you know chocolate covered almonds which is my vice um, then that's when it's a problem right that's when that's when we run into issues so if you can eat well 80 percent of the time and that other 20 percent you let yourself go a little bit that's great no, I think that's great advice. You know, I think, you know, especially your point with the snacking, right? That, you know, that's something um, that's just super important because a lot of us do it mindlessly, you know, myself included, you know, I'm watching football on a Sunday, I'll just sit down with a, you know, a bowl of chips and just eat the whole bowl with, you know, onion dip or whatever it is that I like. And, uh, you know, you're just eating mindlessly. You're not eating, you're not focus, focusing on food as really nutrition, which is what it's supposed to be for. It's more of just something kind of to do. So I, I think that that's really, um, you know, it's an important uh, point, right? Is it, you know, let yourself indulge a little bit, but for the most part, think about what you're doing and think about what you're consuming. Think about plan what you're going to put in your body. Um, do you want to tell people about, you know, the advice you gave me in terms of like the morning routine and, and the smoothie? I thought that was really, that, that's worked out pretty well for me. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, you know, breakfast, what is breakfast? The, what it actually is, is break fast, right? That's where the term came from. So you're kind of fasting throughout the night and then your breakfast is, is when you're breaking that fast. And it is so important to think about what we're breaking the fast with. That truly is the most important meal of the day, whether you have it at 7 a.m. or 12 p.m. Your breakfast is, is so important. So that first meal of the day, there's, there's plenty of studies to show that having a meal higher in healthy proteins and healthy fats is going to sustain you throughout the day. It's going to help control your blood sugars, and it's going to help to improve your metabolism throughout the day. Now, you can also throw in there like a fibrous vegetable um, or fruit to try to get those micronutrients too. So for example, like berries have a lot of fiber in them. They have a ton of, you know, vitamins and minerals um, and antioxidants. And then if you wanted to do something like spinach or arugula on eggs or in a smoothie, you know, that's another way to get some of those good micronutrients. But what you don't want to be doing is loading up on carbohydrates first thing in the morning. So you don't want to be having, you know, a huge bowl of cereal with a banana and apples as, as your breakfast, a huge bowl of fruit is really not going to be good for you first thing in the morning. Your blood sugar is relatively low when you wake up. If you load yourself up with those sugars, you're going to spike through the roof. And that's when we get issues with the blood sugar and with the insulin release and insulin resistance and all of that. So focusing on something that's high in healthy proteins, clean proteins and healthy, you know, non-processed fats. So like avocado, olive oil, nuts, nut butter, those are all, you know, healthy fats to incorporate into, into a breakfast or into a smoothie. You could do protein powder or you could do eggs. You know, those are good things to have first thing in the morning. That's great. And I think just making it, you know, to make it a habit is just so much easier too. So, you know, I think your advice for me and it just, you know, I'm very busy. The morning is crazy, but I just know that I know what goes into my shake and it just, all the ingredients are right there. And, uh, I make it, I put it in the, in the Yeti and I drink it two hours later, you know, to try yeah. to sustain a little bit longer of a fast. Yeah. Um, you know, and I think that the, if you want to just touch on the fasting window too, I think that would be pretty, pretty neat for people to hear about. Yeah. So intermittent fasting, um, although it's been around forever, it's becoming a little bit more popular now. Um, and again, it's not something I would recommend for everybody, but it is something I recommend for a lot of people. Um, and the reason is you're giving yourself that window of time from when you close down the kitchen to when you have your breakfast for your body to rest and rebuild and regenerate. So you go into a different phase of kind of quote unquote healing when you're up to about that 12 hour mark of fasting. So let's say that you finished your breakfast, uh, sorry, your dinner at 7 p.m. You're up to that 12 hour mark at around 7 a.m. So any hours after that, your body is really in that repair stage and it's helping to like clean, detoxify and get rid of all the debris and then build and repair and actually create new cells for your body to function. So a lot of people will do like an 18 to six window where they fast for uh, 18 to six eight to 16, where they fast for um, 16 hours. So if you, let's say, close the kitchen down at 7 p.m., you wouldn't eat again until 11 a.m. And then they eat only during that eight hour window. Now that doesn't mean that you binge during that eight hour window. You're not trying to necessarily get the same number of calories in during a smaller amount of time. Um, you may be eating less calories and that, that's fine. You, your body will adapt to that. And your body's, it's not gonna slow your metabolism down. It's gonna speed your metabolism up but um, your body won't be signaling that you're hungry once it kind of gets used to that routine. And that's a good thing, right? Um, so yeah, but it's different for everybody. Some people do well with just the 12 hours. Some people do great on a 14 hour schedule, which for people would look like, you know, stop eating at seven and then have your breakfast at nine. That's kind of a nice routine for a lot of people. It's when we get in trouble, when we're eating late into the evening, we're eating until 11 o'clock at night. And then we have, you know, something small first, you know, sugar in our coffee. When we wake up at five o'clock in the morning, when we break our fast with sugar in our coffee, right? That's yeah. Not a good way to break the fast. <laughs> no sugar in the coffee at five 30 in the morning. It's not a no. good way. <laughs> Let's talk about, you know, maybe how it relates to PT, right? So, you know, this is obviously going to go out to my, um, you know, all the, all the patients who, who come to concierge. So, you know, when we talk about chronic disease, you know, we see a ton of chronic low back pain, chronic knee pain, shoulder pain. Let's talk about how, you know, an unhealthy diet and, you know, your body's inability to repair itself 
can affect those chronic uh, musculoskeletal disorders. Yeah. So how can you expect your body to rebuild itself if it doesn't have the building blocks needed to rebuild, right? So our cells all need certain micronutrients and macronutrients in order to repair and re restructure and rebuild. And if we're not giving our body that, then we can't expect it to get better. Now, it's so hard. I, I was a PT and, and still am, but I treated for 10 years. And it's really hard to give that advice to somebody who's coming in for physical therapy. Number one, they're, they're not there to see you for nutrition advice. So it's the, the openness to receiving that advice isn't always there. Um, and they're just not ready. They're not prepared for you to necessarily talk to them about that. So um, it's hard sometimes to try to treat somebody in just a, just a physical state, you know, with exercise and manipulation and that type of thing without touching upon the diet, because the diet sometimes is more important. And without bringing those things into your body that you really need in order to build strength, to build skeletal muscle that you're trying to do in physical therapy, you need to have the adequate amounts of protein. You need to have enough vitamin D, magnesium, omega-3s, and so much more. Um, so, you know, changing your diet can vastly change your success with physical therapy and healing from any injury. Yeah, no, I think that's great. And, you know, I think as PTs, you know, we know the importance of, of all of those things, you know, of, you know, nutrition, stress, you know, like we were just talking about sleep, but, you know, to, to over, to unload that on a patient, especially even, you know, at visit two, three or four, it's just, it's a lot, you know, they're focusing on, you know, trying to get out of pain. And a lot of times pain creates this myopic approach to, you know, what I, what do I need to do now and today, you know, yeah. versus how can I plan for tomorrow to make, you know, to make sure that this plan of care is successful. So I think that's our job as practitioners, you know, to be a good PT, you really need to think about the whole thing and connect you who really, you know, can really. Mm -hmm. Ready you know, in the, in the PT clinic when they're yeah. ready to do PT. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and that's part of why I transitioned to doing what I'm doing because I, I didn't feel like okay, I could. Freeze here. Hang on. Oh. <laughs> Are you still there, Will? Okay. There we go. I can hear you now. I just can't quite see you. <laughs> can you hear me? It's a little, I can hear you. It's a little shaky of a connection. Hang on. There we go. Okay. Yeah, I think and, we're, we should be okay. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, that's part of why I transitioned to doing what I'm doing, because I, I felt like, you know, working as a physical therapist, I, I wanted to talk about all these things. But number one, there just isn't the time for it. You know, you have your clients there for an hour, and you have to do PT, you have to do, you have to do the strengthening stuff, the manipulation, that's what they're there for. Um, so oftentimes, there just wasn't enough, there wasn't enough time to talk about the nutrition, which we can spend an hour just talking about that like we have, you know? So um, yeah, having that collaboration between clinicians, between, you know, someone who's speaking to you about your health and your nutrition, someone speaking to you about or, and working with you through physical therapy and then whatever other specialists may be, you know, individual to that person. So important. Yeah, I, I agree. You know, I just think we have to hit, you know, I think the healthcare system, and I think the good practitioners are, are noticing that there's starting to be a paradigm shift from reactive treatment to proactive and preventative treatment. And I think, um, and that's holistic medicine to me, that's looking at everything and seeing, okay, you know, we want to take the research, which is still, you know, um, you know, still kind of that Western approach, but, you know, you also want to combine that with sort of a, a little bit more of an Eastern holistic, um, you know, total body approach too, because it, it takes more than just, you know, cracking necks and, you know, rubbing muscles to really elicit true pain relief. Um, right. And a lot of it's mind related too, you know, and I think mm -hmm. we just got to look at the whole picture and do a, a thorough needs assessment to really make sure that if, you know, we can't cure somebody's physical pain, that there isn't other layers to the onion that we're, that we're missing. You yeah. Know? yeah. Um, Mindset. I, you know, just, you know, not, it yeah. really is. And I think, you know, having practice, you know, we've, we've both practiced for, for around 10 years now, I think, you know, we see the difference, right? You can see the folks who come in with that positive mindset and they're ready to go. And those who, um, you know, don't have, don't believe the PT is going to work. Right. Or, um, you know, they come in, they're overweight, they've got chronic low back pain. And they say, oh, well, I've tried chiropractic. I've tried PT. I've done cortisone shots. I had a surgery. 
it's like, no wonder nothing's working. You know, who is really hitting the root cause? And it is the root cause just tight muscles, fascia joints in a, you know, and a neuromuscular system that's, you know, a little bit, um, you know, the mechanisms are, are, you know, a little bit screwy in, in, in the neurovascular and neuromuscular uh, system. So, you know, I think that extra layer of looking at everything is really important. Um, okay. Let's talk about uh, building habits and rituals related to a healthy lifestyle. Yeah. So, you know, that is part of the key to success, right? Can you create, can you take what you know is good for you and turn it into a habit and a lifestyle, right? Because if it's just a fad and you're just sticking with it for a month or two, you know, you're not going to have long-term success. So how do we change that into something that can be sustainable? So, you know, there's a lot that goes into that, but, you know, you know, a lot about habit habits and building better habits, but one of the strategies you can use is habit stacking. So for example, I have people who it's simple to take supplements yet. It's hard for people, right? So they want to take their vitamin D supplement, but they forget every single day, right? So it's one of the easiest things to do yet. It seems to be one of the hardest things to do. Well, stacking that onto something you do every single day can be helpful. So you brush your teeth every day, right? So putting the vitamin D supplement next to your toothbrush so that when you, before, after you brush your teeth, you're taking your supplement. So finding that activity that's already part of your routine and stacking onto that can be hugely helpful for a lot of people. The other thing is consistency. So finding, first of all, what is your current routine? How does this fit into your schedule? And so that it's not something that's causing you extra stress, right? How does it fit into your schedule? And then how long can you stick with it? Because if you can stick for something with something for, you know, 60 to 90 days, then it starts to become a habit. If you have this kind of light at the, light at the end of the tunnel view of it and you say, well, okay, I'm going to do this for 30 days. You can see the end point and you're probably not going to turn that into a lifestyle strategy. So thinking of it as like, well, I'm going to do this for the next you know, three months and you can't quite see the end, right? That can help to turn it into, into a habit. So finding a, a ritual, finding a way that it fits into your schedule and making it part of a routine. So if you want to work out, you might say that every Monday, Wednesday, Friday at lunchtime, you work out and you're setting that time aside so that it becomes part of that every week routine that you're doing for quite a long time. Um, and that can help you, you build those healthy habits. Also bringing people in can help a lot too. So it's really hard to make a lifestyle change when you're say living with somebody who's not on board, right? So bringing your family into it with you and bringing the people that you, um, socialize with most into it can also help a lot. So if you want to stop drinking, for example, like you can't, your spouse or your, you know, your friends, you can't be going out with them all the time while they're drinking or while your spouse is drinking at home, like trying to, trying to create that habit with the people that you spend the most amount of time with and, and creating that tribe of people around you to support you so that when you feel like you're falling off the bandwagon a little bit, you number one, see that they're doing well and want to join in. And you number two can ask for help. Right. <laughs> oh, I think that's great. And I think, you know, another, um, really important piece to the whole habit creation. And it's just that it, the fact that once you have that habit down, it requires more motivation to break the habit than it does to actually create a new one. Right. So I think that, you know, that's really important. You know, if you're used to taking your supplements, you know, with your cup of coffee in the morning and you do that for two straight months, it's just going to be second nature. You're not going to think, you know, do I need to take my supplements because you just, it's something you already do. So there's free brain space, <laughs> brain space in that, um, you know, that time that you might be thinking, Hey, do I need to take my supplements? Do I need to pack my lunch? Do I need to put my laptop in my car? Do I need to feed my daughter? Do I need to feed the dog? Do I need to... <laughs> it's just a million different things. And I think it, to your point, we were talking about earlier, if we can quiet the mind, we'll have the opportunity to make better decisions uh, yeah. when it comes to yeah. our health. Yeah. That decision uh, fatigue, it's a, it's a real thing. You know, it takes up a lot of space in our life. So yeah. right. Being able to eliminate yeah. that hugely beneficial. All right. So just, um, you know, if you could just kind of tell, you know, our, our listeners how they can reach out to you and work with you and, and sort of your role as a health coach and, uh, and what you do. Yeah. So normally when people come to me, we set up an initial consultation, um, which is a 50 minute consultation and we just go over, 
you know, what their, what their concerns are, what their health issues are, um, and what their personal goals are. And then I tailor, you know, their, our routine and our diet and our, our nutrition recommendations to that individual. Um, and then typically after that, we do 30 minutes follow-up sessions, depending on the client that depends on how many we do. And we focus on improving their diet, improving their routines, um, working on their stress management, their sleep and, and more. Um, but people can just look me up through my website, which I'll send to you, Sean, maybe you can send it over with this, with this um, webinar recording. And I'll also give my email. My email is probably the best way to reach me and set up an appointment. You can also do it through my website, but, um, email is a good way for me to figure out, you know, when, when is good for us both and, and get a little bit more information on you and send you my client questionnaire as well so that we can do beforehand. So yeah, just shoot me an email and give me some available times that you have. And I'd love to meet with some of your clients. It'd be great. <laughs> yeah. So what we'll do is, uh, since this will be a, a podcast, we'll, uh, we'll put the links, um, you know, in the bio of the podcast, we'll put the links in the, um, in the show notes. So anything you have, just attach along and, um, anybody listening to this on iTunes can, can get those. So that'll be great. But uh, thanks for joining us today, Val, and uh, really appreciate it joining me. And um, you know, I'm sure we'll have you back soon. It was good to see you as always, Sean. We'll talk soon. Wonderful. Thanks, Val. <laughs> Bye.